Hi everyone, this is Doc Ina and this is my lecture on endocrine disorders in pregnancy. To download my lecture deck, please go to my WordPress site, Doc Ina Obigaine. Main reference for this lecture is Williams Obstetrics 24th Edition, Chapter 58, Endocrine Disorders in Pregnancy. This is the outline of my lecture. So basically, I will tackle four endocrine glands and discuss how disorders of in each of these glands can possibly affect pregnancy. So first, let's discuss thyroid disorders. Maternal thyroid changes are substantial, and normally altered gland structure and function are sometimes confused with thyroid abnormalities. First, maternal serum concentrations of thyroid binding globulin are increased concomitantly with total or bound thyroid hormone levels. Secondly, Thyrotropin, also called thyroid stimulating hormone, currently plays a central role in screening and diagnosis of many thyroid disorders. Serum TSH levels in early pregnancy decline because of weak TSH receptor stimulation from massive quantities of human chorionic gonadotropin or HCG that is secreted by the placental trophoblast. Because TSH does not cross the placenta, it has no direct fetal effects. During the first 12 weeks of gestation, when HCG serum levels are maximal, thyroid hormone secretion is stimulated. The resulting increased serum 3 thyroxine levels act to suppress hypothalamic thyrotropin releasing hormone and in turn limit pituitary TSH secretion. Accordingly, TRH is undetectable in maternal serum. Conversely, beginning at mid pregnancy, TRH becomes detectable in fetal serum, but levels are static and do not increase with advancing gestation. Throughout pregnancy, maternal thyroxine is transferred to the fetus. Maternal thyroxine is important for normal fetal brain development, especially before development of fetal thyroid gland function. And even though the fetal gland begins concentrating iodine and synthesizing thyroid hormone after 12 weeks age of gestation, maternal thyroxine contribution remains very important. In fact, maternal sources account for 30% of thyroxine in fetal serum at term. Developmental risks associated with maternal hypothyroidism after mid-pregnancy remain poorly understood. Most thyroid disorders are inextricably linked to autoantibodies against various cell components, and several of these antibodies variably stimulate thyroid function, block function, or cause thyroid inflammation that may lead to follicular cell destruction. Often, these effects overlap or even coexist. Thyroid stimulating autoantibodies, aka thyroid stimulating immunoglobulins, bind to the TSH receptor and activate it, causing thyroid hyperfunction and growth. Thyroid peroxidase is a thyroid gland enzyme that normally functions in the production of thyroid hormones. Thyroid peroxidase antibodies, previously called thyroid microsomal autoantibodies, are directed against TPO and have been identified in 5-15% of all pregnant women, and this is associated in some studies with early pregnancy loss and preterm birth. Because normal pregnancy simulates some clinical findings that are similar to thyroxine excess, clinically mild thyrotoxicosis may be very difficult to diagnose. Suggestive findings include tachycardia that exceeds that usually seen with normal pregnancy, thyromegaly, exophthalmos, and failure to gain weight despite adequate food intake. Laboratory confirmation is by a markedly depressed TSH level along with an elevated FD4. Rarely, hyperthyroidism is caused by abnormally high serum triiodothyronine or T3 levels, which is also so-called T3 toxicosis. The overwhelming cause of thyrotoxicosis in pregnancy is Graves' disease, and this is an organ-specific autoimmune process associated with thyroid-stimulating TSH receptor antibodies. Because these antibodies are specific to Graves' hyperthyroidism, such assays have been proposed for diagnosis, management, and prognosis, and pregnancies complicated by hyperthyroidism. With Graves' disease, during the course of pregnancy, hyperthyroid symptoms may initially worsen because of chorionic gonadotropin stimulation, but then subsequently diminish with decreases in receptor antibody titers in the second half of pregnancy. The treatment for thyrotoxicosis during pregnancy can nearly always be controlled by thionamide drugs. 
propyl thiouracil or PTU has been historically preferred because it partially inhibits the conversion of T4 to T3 and crosses the placenta less readily than methimazole. Methimazole has also been associated with a rare embryopathy which is characterized by esophageal or coanal atresia as well as aplasia cutis which is a congenital skin defect. Transient leukopenia can be documented in up to 10% of women taking antithyroid drugs, but this does not require therapy cessation. In rare cases, however, a granulocytosis develops suddenly and mandates drug discontinuance. It is not dose-related and because of its acute onset, serial leukocyte counts during therapy are not helpful. Thus, if fever or sore throat develops, women are instructed to discontinue medication immediately and report for a complete blood count. Hepatotoxicity is another potentially serious side effect that develops in 0.1 to 0.2% of women. Serial measurement of hepatic enzymes has not been shown to prevent fulminant PTU-related hepatotoxicity. Also, approximately 20% of patients treated with PTU develop antineutrophil cytoplasmic antibodies or ANCA. However, only a small percentage of this subsequently develop serious vasculitis. Finally, although thionamides have the potential to cause fetal complications, these are very rare. In some cases, thionamides may even be therapeutic because TSH receptor antibodies cross the placenta and can stimulate the fetal thyroid gland to cause thyrotoxicosis and goiter. The initial thionamide dose is empirical. For non-pregnant patients, the American Thyroid Association recommends that methimazole be used at a initial higher daily dose of 10 to 20 mg orally followed by a lower maintenance dose of 5 to 10 mg. If PTU is selected, then a dose of 50 to 150 mg three times daily may be initiated depending on clinical severity. For pregnant women, we usually give 300 to 450 mg of PTU daily in three divided doses. Occasionally, daily doses of 600 mg are necessary. We generally do not transition women to methimazole during the second trimester. The goal is treatment with the lowest possible thionamide dose to maintain thyroid hormone levels slightly above or in the high normal range while TSH levels remain suppressed. Serum-free T4 concentrations are measured every 4 to 6 weeks. Subtotal thyroidectomy can be performed after thyrotoxicosis is medically controlled. This seldom is done during pregnancy but may be appropriate for the very few women who cannot adhere to medical treatment or in whom drug therapy proves toxic. Surgery is best accomplished in the second trimester. Potential drawbacks of thyroidectomy during pregnancy include inadvertent resection of parathyroid glands and injury to the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Thyroid ablation with therapeutic radioactive iodide is contraindicated during pregnancy. In untreated women or in those who remain hyperthyroid despite therapy, there is a higher incidence of preeclampsia, heart failure, and adverse perinatal outcomes. Clinical hyperthyroidism develops in approximately 1% of neonates born to women with Graves' disease. Fetus or neonate who was exposed to excessive maternal thyroxine may have any of the several clinical presentations. First, goitrous thyrotoxicosis is caused by placental transfer of thyroid-stimulating immunoglobulins. Non-immune high drops and fetal demise have been reported with fetal thyrotoxicosis. The best predictor of perinatal thyrotoxicosis is presence of thyroid-stimulating TSH receptor antibodies in women with Graves' disease. This is especially true if their levels are more than threefold higher than the upper normal limit. The American Thyroid Association and American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists recommend routine evaluation of TSH receptor antibodies between 22 and 26 weeks in women with Graves' disease. The American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, or the ACOG, however, does not recommend such testing because management is rarely changed by the results. If the fetus is thyrotoxic, treatment is by adjustment of maternal thionamide drugs even though maternal thyroid function may be within the targeted range. Occasionally, 
Neonatal thyrotoxicosis may also require short course antithyroid drug treatment. A second presentation is goitrous hypothyroidism caused by fetal exposure to maternally administered thionamides. Although there are theoretical neurological implications, reports of adverse fetal effects seem to have been exaggerated. Available data indicate that thionamides carry an extremely small risk for causing neonatal hypothyroidism. If hypothyroidism is identified, the fetus can be treated by a reduced maternal antithyroid medication dose and injection of intraamnionic thyroxine if necessary. A third presentation is non-goitrous hypothyroidism and this may develop from transplacental passage of maternal TSH receptor blocking antibodies. And finally, fetal thyrotoxicosis after maternal thyroid gland ablation, usually with 131i radioiodine, may result from transplacental thyroid stimulating antibodies. Thyroid storm and heart failure are both acute and life threatening in pregnancy. Thyroid storm is a hypermetabolic state and is rare during pregnancy. In contrast, pulmonary hypertension and heart failure from cardiomyopathy caused by the profound myocardial effects of thyroxine is common among pregnant women. In these women, cardiomyopathy is characterized by a high output state which may lead to a dilated cardiomyopathy. The pregnant woman with thyrotoxicosis has minimal cardiac reserve and decompensation is usually precipitated by preeclampsia, anemia, sepsis, or a combination of these conditions. Fortunately, thyroxine-induced cardiomyopathy and pulmonary hypertension are frequently reversible. This is the algorithm for the management of thyroid storm and heart failure. The treatment for thyroid storm or heart failure is similar and should be carried out in an ICU and may include special care units within labor and delivery. This figure is our stepwise approach to medical treatment of thyroid storm or thyrotoxic heart failure. An hour or two after initial thionamide administration, iodide is given to inhibit thyroidal release of T3 and T4. It can be given intravenously as sodium iodide or orally as either saturated solution of potassium iodide or that's SSKI or Lugol solution. With a history of iodine-induced anaphylaxis, lithium carbonate at 300 mg every 6 hours is given instead. Most authorities recommend dexamethasone 2 mg intravenously every 6 hours for 4 doses to block peripheral conversion of T4 to T3. If a beta blocker drug is given to control tachycardia, its effect on heart failure must be considered. Propanolol, labetalol, and esmolol have all been used successfully. Coexisting severe preeclampsia, infection, or anemia should be aggressively managed before delivery is considered. Transient biochemical features of hyperthyroidism may be observed in 2-15% of women in early pregnancy. Many women with hyperemesis gravidarum have abnormally high serum thyroxine levels and low TSH levels. This results from TSH receptor stimulation from massive, but normal for pregnancy concentrations of HCG. This transient condition is also termed gestational transient thyrotoxicosis. Even if associated with hyperemesis, antithyroid drugs are not warranted. Serum thyroxine and TSH values usually become normal by mid-pregnancy. The prevalence of increased thyroxine levels in women with molar pregnancy has been reported to be between 25 and 65 percent. Abnormally high HCG levels lead to overstimulation of the TSH receptor. Because these tumors are now usually diagnosed early, clinically apparent hyperthyroidism has become less common nowadays. With definitive treatment, serum free T4 levels usually normalize rapidly in parallel with the decline in HCG concentrations. Subclinical hyperthyroidism is characterized by abnormally low serum TSH concentration in concert with thyroxine hormone levels within the normal reference range. In other words, you have a low TSH concentration but within normal levels of FT4. Long-term effects of persistent subclinical thyrotoxicosis include osteoporosis, cardiovascular morbidities, and progression to overt thyrotoxicosis or thyroid failure. 
Subclinical hyperthyroidism is not associated with adverse pregnancy outcomes. The American Thyroid Association and the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists recommend treatment of subclinical hyperthyroidism among women 65 years or older and in postmenopausal women to improve cardiovascular health and bone mineral density. Overt or symptomatic hypothyroidism has been reported to complicate between 2 and 10 pregnancies per 1,000. It is characterized by insidious nonspecific clinical findings that include fatigue, constipation, cold intolerance, muscle cramps, and weight gain. A pathologically enlarged thyroid gland depends on the etiology of hypothyroidism and is more likely in women in areas of endemic iodine deficiency or those with Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Other findings include edema, dry skin, hair loss, and prolonged relaxation phase of deep tendon reflexes. Clinical or overt hypothyroidism is confirmed when an abnormally high serum TSH level is accompanied by an abnormally low thyroxine level. The most common cause of hypothyroidism in pregnancy is Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is characterized by glandular destruction from autoantibodies, particularly antithyroid peroxidase antibodies. Clinical identification of hypothyroidism is especially difficult during pregnancy because many of the signs and symptoms are also common in pregnancy itself. Thyroid analyte testing should be performed on symptomatic women only or those with a history of thyroid disease. Severe hypothyroidism during pregnancy is uncommon, probably because it is often associated with infertility and increased spontaneous abortion rates. Even women with treated hypothyroidism undergoing IVF have a significantly decreased chance of achieving pregnancy. As for the treatment, the American Thyroid Association and American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists recommend replacement therapy for hypothyroidism, beginning with levothyroxine in doses of 1 to 2 micrograms per kilograms per day or approximately 100 micrograms daily. However, women who are athyreotic after thyroidectomy or radioiodine therapy may require higher doses. Surveillance is with TSH levels measured at 4 to 6 week intervals and the thyroxine dose is adjusted by 25 to 50 microgram increments until TSH values become normal. Pregnancy is associated with an increased thyroxine requirement in approximately a third of, pre of supplemented women. Because a similar increased requirement is seen in women with postmenopausal hypothyroidism after est estrogen replacement, the increased demand in pregnancy is believed to be related to increased estrogen production. Now let us tackle iodine deficiency. Dietary iodine requirements are increased during pregnancy due to increased thyroid hormone production, increased renal losses, and fetal iodine requirements. Adequate iodine is requisite for fetal neurological development beginning soon after conception and abnormalities are dependent on the degree of deficiency. The WHO has estimated that at least 50 million people worldwide have varying degrees of preventable brain damage due to iodine deficiency. Although it is doubtful that mild deficiency causes intellectual impairment, supplementation does prevent fetal goiter. Severe deficiency, on the other hand, is frequently associated with damage, typically encountered with endemic cretinism. Now, it is presumed that moderate deficiency has intermediate and variable effects. The Institute of Medicine recommends daily iodine intake during pregnancy of 220 micrograms per day and 290 micrograms per day for lactating women. The Endocrine Society recommends an average iodine intake of 150 micrograms per day in childbearing age women and this should be increased to 250 micrograms during pregnancy and breastfeeding. The American Thyroid Association has recommended that 150 micrograms of iodine be added to prenatal vitamins to achieve this average daily intake. On the other hand, experts caution against over-supplementation. Excessive iodine intake, which is defined as more than 300 micrograms per day, may lead to subclinical hypothyroidism and autoimmune thyroiditis. And the Endocrine Society, in accordance with the WHO, advises against exceeding twice the daily recommended intake of iodine or 500 micrograms per day. 
Congenital hypothyroidism is one of the most preventable causes of mental retardation worldwide. Developmental disorders of the thyroid gland such as agenesis and hypoplasia account for about 80-90% to of these cases. Early and aggressive thyroxine replacement is critical for infants with congenital hypothyroidism. In addition to timing of treatment, the severity of congenital hypothyroidism is an important factor in long-term cognitive outcomes. In infants with screening results suggestive of severe hypothyroidism, therapy should be started immediately even without waiting for the confirmatory results. Postpartum thyroiditis is also called transient autoimmune thyroiditis and is consistently found in approximately 5-10% to of women during the first year after childbirth. Postpartum thyroid dysfunction with an onset within 12 months includes hyperthyroidism, hypothyroidism, or both. The propensity for thyroiditis antedates pregnancy and is directly related to increasing serum levels of thyroid autoantibodies. Up to 50% of women who are thyroid antibody positive in the first trimester will develop postpartum thyroiditis. In clinical practice, postpartum thyroiditis is diagnosed infrequently because it is typically developing months after delivery and causes vague and nonspecific symptoms that often are thought to be stresses of motherhood. The clinical presentation varies and classically there are two recognized clinical phases that may develop in succession. The first and earliest is destruction-induced thyrotoxicosis with symptoms from excessive release of hormone due to glandular disruption. The onset is abrupt and a small painless goiter is commonly found. Although there are many symptoms, only fatigue and palpitations are the most common. The second and usually later phase is clinical hypothyroidism from thyroiditis between 4 and 8 months postpartum. Thyromegaly and other symptoms are common and more prominent than during the thyrotoxic phase. Thyroxine replacement with 25 to 75 micrograms daily is typically given for 6 to 12 months. Let's discuss nodular thyroid disease. Thyroid nodules can be found in 1-2% to of reproductive age women. Management of a palpable thyroid nodule during pregnancy depends on gestational age and mass size. Small nodules detected by sensitive sonographic methods are more common during pregnancy in some populations. Biopsy of those more than 5 mm cube that persisted at 3 months usually showed nodular hyperplasia and none was malignant. In some studies, however, up to 40% of solitary nodules were malignant, and even so, most were low-grade neoplasms. Evaluation of thyroid nodules during pregnancy should be similar to that for the non-pregnant women. Most recommend against radioiodine scanning in pregnancy despite the fact that tracer doses used are associated with mi minimal fetal irradiation. Sonographic examination reliably detects nodules greater than 0.5 cm and their solid or cystic structures also is determined. According to the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, sonographic characteristics associated with malignancy include hypoechogenic pattern, irregular margins, and microcalcifications. Fine needle aspiration is an excellent assessment method and histological tumor markers and immunostaining are reliable to evaluate for malignancy. If the FNA biopsy shows a follicular lesion, surgery may be deferred until after delivery. Evaluation of thyroid cancer involves a multidisciplinary approach. Most thyroid carcinomas are well differentiated and pursue an indolent course. When thyroid malignancy is diagnosed during its first or the second trimester, then thyroidectomy may be performed before the third trimester. In women without evidence of an aggressive thyroid cancer or in those diagnosed in the third trimester, surgical treatment can be deferred to the immediate postpartum period. The next section would be the parathyroid diseases. The function of the parathyroid is to maintain extracellular fluid calcium concentration. This 115 amino acid hormone acts directly on bone and kidney and indirectly on the small intestine through its effects on synthesis of vitamin D to increase serum calcium. Secretion is regulated by serum ionized calcium concentration through a negative feedback system. Calcitonin is a potent parathyroid hormone that acts as a physiological parathyroid hormone antagonist. Fetal calcium needs is about 300 mg per day 
in late pregnancy and a total of 30 grams, as well as increased renal calcium loss from augmented glomerular filtration, substantially increases maternal calcium demands. Pregnancy is associated with a twofold rise in serum concentrations of 125-dihydroxyvitamin D, which increases gastrointestinal calcium absorption. This fluctuating hormone is probably of placental and decidual origin because maternal PTH levels are low normal or decreased during pregnancy. Total serum calcium levels decline with serum albumin concentrations, but ionized calcium levels remain unchanged. Hypercalcemia is caused by hyperparathyroidism or cancer in 90% of cases. And primary hyperparathyroidism is reported most often in women older than 50 years old. Hypercalcemic crisis manifests as stupor, nausea, vomiting, weakness, fatigue, and dehydration. All women with symptomatic hyperparathyroidism should be surgically treated. And the indications for parathyroidectomy include a serum calcium level that's 1 mg per deciliter above the, normal, the upper normal range, a calculated creatinine clearance less than 60 ml per minute, reduced bone density, or age less than 50 years. Those not meeting this criteria should for undergo annual calcium and creatinine level measurement and bone density assessment every 1 to 2 years. How about hyperthyroidism during pregnancy? As in non-pregnant patients, hyperparathyroidism is usually caused by a parathyroid adenoma. And the symptoms usually include hyperemesis, generalized weakness, renal calculi, and psychiatric disorders. Occasionally, pancreatitis is the presenting finding. Pregnancy theoretically improves hyperparathyroidism because of significant calcium shunting to the fetus and augmented renal excretion. Now, when the protective effects of pregnancy are withdrawn, there is significant danger of postpartum hypercalcemic crisis and this life-threatening complication can be seen with serum calcium levels greater than 14 mg per deciliter and is characterized by nausea, vomiting, tremors, dehydration, and mental status changes. What is the management of hyperparathyroidism during pregnancy? Surgical removal of a symptomatic parathyroid adenoma is preferable. Elective neck exploration during pregnancy is usually well tolerated even in the third trimester. Medical management may be appropriate in asymptomatic pregnant women with mild hypercalcemia, and patients are carefully monitored in the postpartum period for hypercalcemic crisis. The initial medical management might include calcitonin to decrease skeletal calcium release, or oral phosphate, 1 to 1.5 grams per day in divided doses to bind excess calcium. For women with dangerously elevated serum calcium levels or those who are mentally abtunded with hypercalcemic crisis, emergency treatment is instituted using the following. Diuresis with intravenous normal saline is begun so that urine flow exceeds 150 ml per hour. Furosemide is also given in conventional doses to block tubular calcium reabsorption, and hypokalemia and hypomagnesemia should be prevented. Adjunctive therapy includes also mithromycin, which inhibits bone resorption. What are the neonatal effects of hyperparathyroidism? With maternal hyperparathyroidism, abnormally elevated maternal and fetal levels further suppress fetal parathyroid function, and because of this, after birth, there is a rapidly decreasing newborn calcium level and 15-25% to 25 of these infants develop severe hypocalcemia with or without tetany. Neonatal hypoparathyroidism caused by maternal hyperparathyroidism is usually transient and should be treated with calcium in calcitriol. Calcitriol will not be effective in preterm infants because the intestinal vitamin D receptor is not sufficiently expressed. Neonatal tetany or seizure should stimulate an evaluation for maternal hyperparathyroidism. We move on to hypoparathyroidism. The most common cause of hypocalcemia is hypoparathyroidism that usually follows parathyroid or thyroid surgery. Hypoparathyroidism is estimated to follow up to 7% of total thyroidectomies. It is rare and characterized by facial muscle spasms, muscle cramps, and paresthesia of the lips, tongue, fingers, and feet and this can progress to tetany and seizures. 
Chronically hypocalcemic pregnant women may also have a fetus with skeletal demineralization resulting in multiple bone fractures in the neonatal period. Maternal treatment includes 1,25-dihydroxyvitamin D3 or that's calcitriol, dihydrotachysterol or large vitamin D doses of 50,000 to 150,000 units per day, calcium gluconate or calcium lactate in doses of 3 to 5 grams per day, and a low phosphate diet. The therapeutic challenge in women with known hypoparathyroidism is management of blood calcium levels, and the goal during pregnancy is maintenance of the corrected calcium level in the low normal range. Carefully monitor the corrected serum calcium on a frequent, perhaps monthly basis throughout pregnancy. There is also what we call the pregnancy-associated osteoporosis, although very rare. Women who breastfeed, carried twin pregnancies, or had a low body mass index were at higher risk of bone loss or pregnancy-associated osteoporosis. Lactation represents a period of negative calcium balance that is corrected through maternal skeletal absorption or resorption. The most common symptom of osteoporosis is back pain in late pregnancy or postpartum. Other symptoms include hip pain, either unilateral or bilateral, and difficulty in weight-bearing until nearly immobilized. In more than half of women, no apparent reason for osteopenia is found. Some known causes include heparin, prolonged bed rest, and corticosteroid therapy. Treatment should include calcium and vitamin D supplementation as well as standard pain management, and women and their offspring may have chronic osteopenia. The third section is the adrenal gland disorders. First, we talk about pheochromocytoma, and these tumors are very rare and are found in 0.1% of hypertensive patients. These are chromaffin tumors that secrete catecholamines and usually are located in the adrenal medulla, although 10% are located in sympathetic ganglia. They are called the 10% tumor because approximately 10% are bilateral, 10% are extra-adrenal, and 10% are malignant can be associated with medal these tumors can be associated with medullary thyroid carcinoma and hyperparathyroidism the symptoms include hypertensive crisis seizure disorders or anxiety attacks other symptoms during paroxysmal attacks are headaches profuse sweating palpitations chest pain nausea and vomiting and pallor or flushing the standard screening test is quantification of catecholamine metabolites in a 24-hour urine specimen. And the diagnosis is by measurement of a 24-hour urine collection with at least two of three assays for free catecholamines, metanephrines, or vanillimandelic acid, or VMA. For most cases, preferred treatment is laparoscopic adrenalectomy. The diagnosis of pheochromocytoma in pregnancy is similar to that for non-pregnant patients. MRI is the preferred imaging technique because it almost always locates adrenal and extra-adrenal pheochromocytomas. The principal challenge is to differentiate preeclampsia from the hypertensive crisis caused by pheochromocytoma. So how do we manage this condition? First, we do immediate control of hypertension and symptoms with a Alpha adrenergic blockers such as phenoxybenzamine with a dose of 10 to 30 milligrams two to four times daily. After alpha blockade is achieved, we give beta blockers for tachycardia. In many cases, surgical exploration and tumor removal are performed during pregnancy, preferably during the second trimester. Laparoscopic removal of adrenal tumors has become the norm. If diagnosed later in pregnancy, either planned cesarean delivery with tumor excision or postpartum resection is appropriate. We now discuss Cushing syndrome. Most cases of Cushing syndrome are iatrogenic, and this is secondary to long-term corticosteroid treatment. The endogenous type of Cushing syndrome is typically secondary to Cushing's disease, which is a bilateral adrenal hyperplasia stimulated by corticotropin-producing pituitary adenomas. Abnormal secretion of hypothalamic corticotropin-releasing factor may cause corticotropic hyperplasia, and this hyperplasia may also be caused by non-endocrine tumors that produce polypeptides similar to either corticotropin-releasing factor or corticotropin. Typical Cushingoid body habitus is caused by adipose tissue deposition that characteristically results in moon fasces, a buffalo hump, 
and truncal obesity. Easy fatigability and weakness, hypertension, hirsutism, and amenorrhea are some of the signs of this syndrome. The diagnosis of Cushing syndrome is established with elevated plasma cortisol levels that cannot be suppressed by dexamethasone or by elevated 24-hour urine-free cortisol excretion. CT and MRI are used to localize pituitary and adrenal tumors or hyperplasia. So how does Cushing syndrome affect pregnancy? Well, pregnancy is rare for, for women with Cushing syndrome because Cushing syndrome usually causes an ovulation and therefore infertility. And Cushing syndrome during pregnancy is difficult to diagnose because, because of pregnancy-induced increases in plasma cortisol or corticotropin and CRF levels. The measurement of 24-hour urinary free cortisol excretion is recommended during pregnancy. Heart failure is common during pregnancy and is a major cause of maternal morbidity or mortality. Hypercortisolism in pregnancy may also cause poor wound healing, osteoporotic fractures, and psychiatric complications. The definitive therapy is resection of the pituitary or adrenal adenoma or bilateral adrenalectomy for hyperplasia. Metirapone may be given as an interim treatment until definitive surgery after delivery. However, treatment during pregnancy with the male fetus is usually worrisome because this drug also blocks testicular steroidogenesis. Mifepristone, the norethindrone derivative used for abortion and labor induction, has shown promise for treating Cushing's disease but should not be used in pregnancy, of course. We move on now to adrenal insufficiency or what we call the Addison's disease. Primary adrenocortical insufficiency is rare because more than 90% of total gland volume must be destroyed for symptoms to develop. Autoimmune adrenalitis is the most common cause in the developed world. However, tuberculosis is most common in resource-poor countries. There is increased incidence of concurrent Hashimoto thyroiditis premature ovarian failure, type 1 diabetes, and Graves' disease. And these polyglandular autoimmune syndromes also include pernicious anemia, vitiligo, alopecia, non-tropical sprue, and myasthenia gravis. Untreated adrenal hypofunction frequently causes infertility, but with replacement therapy, ovulation is restored, and therefore fertility is restored. If untreated, symptoms often include weakness, fatigue, nausea, and vomiting, and weight loss. Because serum cortisol levels are increased during pregnancy, the finding of a low value should prompt an adrenocorticotropic hormone or ACTH stimulation test to document the lack of response to infused corticotropin. Now let us discuss primary aldosteronism. This may be due to adrenal aldosteronoma or in 75% of cases or idiopathic bilateral adrenal hyperplasia and adrenal carcinoma. The findings include hypertension, hypokalemia, and muscle weakness. And the diagnosis is established by high serum or urine levels of aldosterone. Since renin levels are suppressed in pregnant women with hyperaldosteronism, a plasma aldosterone to renin activity ratio may be helpful for the diagnosis of this condition. Medical management includes potassium supplementation and antihypertensive therapy. Hypertension responds to spironolactone. Beta blockers or calcium channel blockers may be preferred because of the potential fetal androgenic effects of spironolactone. Amiloride and eplerinone also can be used. Tumor resection is curative and laparoscopic adrenalectomy has been shown to be safe. The last section are the pituitary disorders. So first, we tackle prolactinomas. Prolactinomas are usually adenomas, and the symptoms and findings include amenorrhea, galactorrhea, and hyperprolactinemia. Tumors are classified arbitrarily by their size, as measured by the CT scan or MRI. Microadenoma is less than or equal to 10 millimeters, and a macroadenoma is more than 10 millimeters. The treatment for microadenomas is usually with bromocriptine. For supracellular mac macroadenoma, most recommend surgical resection before pregnancy is attempted. 15-35% to 35 of supracellular macroadenomas have tumor enlargement that causes visual disturbances, headaches, and diabetes insipidus. 
Pregnant women with microadenoma should be monitored for headaches and visual symptoms. Those with macroadenoma should be followed more closely and have visual field testing during each trimester. CT or MRI is recommended only if symptoms develop, but of course, we prefer MRI rather than CT scan. Serial serum prolactin levels are not recommended. Symptomatic tumor enlargement should be treated immediately with a dopamine antagonist such as bromocryptine or cabergoline. How about acromegaly? Acromegaly is caused by excessive growth hormone, usually from an acidophilic or a chromophobic pituitary adenoma. In normal pregnancy, pituitary growth hormone levels decrease as placental epitopes are secreted. The diagnosis is failure of an oral glucose tolerance test to suppress pituitary growth hormone. Pregnancy is probably rare in women with acromegaly because most are hyperprolactinemic and anovulatory and therefore infertile. But for those women who are pregnant, they have increased risk of gestational diabetes and hypertension. The management is similar to that for prolactinomas with close monitoring for symptoms of tumor enlargement. Dopamine agonist therapy is not as effective as it is for prolactinomas, and transphenoidal resection may be necessary for symptomatic tumor enlargement during pregnancy. Next is diabetes insipidus. The vasopressin deficiency evident in diabetes insipidus is usually due to a hypothalamic or pituitary stock disorder rather than a pituitary lesion. True diabetes insipidus is a rare complication of pregnancy. And the management is intranasal administration of a synthetic analog of vasopressin or desmopressin. Transient secondary diabetes insipidus is more likely encountered with acute fatty liver of pregnancy, and this is due to altered vasopressinase clearance because of hepatic dysfunction. Next is Sheehan syndrome, and this is secondary to pituitary ischemia and necrosis associated with obstetrical hemorrhage that could result in hypopituitarism. Affected women may have persistent hypotension, tachycardia, hypoglycemia, and lactation failure. Because adrenal insufficiency is the most life-threatening complication of Sheehan syndrome, adrenal function should be immediately assessed in any woman, in any woman suspected of having Sheehan syndrome. After glucocorticoid replacement, subsequent analysis and replacement of thyroid, gonadal, and growth hormones should be considered. Lastly, we discuss lymphocytic hypophysitis. This is an autoimmune pituitary disorder that is characterized by massive infiltration by lymphocytes and plasma cells with parenchymal destruction of the gland. And most cases are temporally linked to pregnancy. This condition usually manifests with symptoms of mass effect, including headaches and visual field defects. And usually there's a cellar mass that is seen with CT scan or MRI and a mass that is accompanied by a modestly elevated serum prolactin level, usually less than 100 picograms per ml, suggests or is suggestive of a lymphocytic hypophysitis. Etiology of this condition is unknown, but nearly 30% have a history of coexisting autoimmune diseases such as Hashimoto thyroiditis, Addison's disease, type 1 diabetes, and pernicious anemia. Treatment of this condition is with hormone replacement, and surgery during pregnancy is warranted only in cases of severe chiasmal compression unresponsive to corticosteroid therapy. That's it for my lecture. Thank you for listening, and uh, please don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel, Ina Erabon, and my WordPress site, Dokina Thank you so much.